McCarthy required the Thank better you. part of a week to grind down the conservative opposition to his speaker bid and the way things have been done in the House for decades. One of the holdouts, Republican Congressman Chip Roy of Texas, was instrumental in delivering him the gavel. Roy negotiated a laundry list of concessions from McCarthy designed to spread power among the House rank and file, and particularly the House Freedom Caucus. And Roy's deal ultimately flipped up to 15 votes for McCarthy, paving the way for his victory Friday night. Joining me now for his first interview after the speaker election is Texas Republican Congressman Chip Roy. First of all, congratulations uh, on everything that happened and getting what you wanted in the negotiations. It's not, it's not necessarily a sure thing that that, that, that happens. Um, we are just uh, learning some of the promises McCarthy made, uh, capping spending at 2022 levels for yeah. fiscal year 2024, a subcommittee to investigate the Justice Department, more Freedom Caucus representation on important committees like the Rules Committee, a one-member threshold for a motion to vacate, which is what it used to be before 2019. What other commitments did McCarthy make that you can tell us about? Well, first of all, uh, you know, let's remember that uh, a little temporary conflict is necessary in this town in order to stop this town from rolling over the American people. I don't think anybody uh, on either side of the aisle could uh, say with a straight face that they think that Washington is doing uh, good work for the American people on a regular basis and isn't broken. Uh, it, we, we have to work to fix this place. And look, some of the tensions you saw on display uh, when we saw some of the, you know, the interactions there between Mike Rogers and Matt Gaetz, uh, you know, some of that is we need a little of that. We need a little of this sort of breaking the glass in order to get us to the table and orders to fight for the American people and to change the way this place is dysfunctional. So this all started going back last summer. We wanted rules to open this place up. We wanted more transparency, we wanted more openness, more ability to add uh, amendments to the floor. So, for example, you ask, what else did we get? We got amendments to be able to, I'm sorry, we got the ability to offer amendments on the floor of the House during appropriations uh, that will open it up again. We haven't done that. So since I've been in Congress, I've not been able to offer an amendment on the floor. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been a, an amendment offered in open debate since May of 2016. Is it a free for all, that. like anyone can offer an amendment? Absolutely, in appropriations. Uh, we will also be striving for more open rules. Uh, we put uh, more uh, conservatives, uh, some Freedom Caucus members, and we're, we're still working through who those will be on the Rules Committee, the powerful Rules Committee, which is the funnel by which legislation gets to the floor of the House. Um, but importantly, we were trying to stand up for rank-and-file members because too often, and we saw this in, in December, uh, too often bills are cooked up with a handful of people, they're brought through to the Rules Committee, jammed through, put on the floor, and you have to vote yes or no. The American people are tired of that. We need to be able to see some of the stuff we got to see this week. You and I were talking ahead of time. Cameras, because C-SPAN control the cameras. Do you, are you in favor of that? Because I love these C-SPAN cameras. I, look, I, I think drawing the American people into the conversations, the debate on the floor, I mean, if you're going to have cameras there, well, let's look at the action. Let's see. So you're in favor of transparency. C-SPAN gets to control it. Well, I would, I, I, let me go look into the you know, ins and outs of all of that, but I think it is what the American people were able to see unfold on the floor was a good thing for our democracy and our republic, right? It was a good thing for people to be able to see the inner workings and this isn't just a shirts and skins, red and blue, you know, two-team thing. This is history because this hasn't happened in the last 100 years. But understand why that's so. Two-party entrenchment has made it to where we don't have a good back and forth yeah. to sit at the table and try to accomplish this. So I'm all in favor of transparency. I'm a journalist. I want everything sure. out. Um, so I hope you'll look into the C-SPAN thing yeah. because, because I think that really does show the American people. I don't think it's a bad thing to show Democrats and Republicans, tough negotiations, et cetera. Will, in the name of transparency, will you or the speaker put out a list of the concessions of these changes? Because they're not all, as you know, they're not all reflected in the rules that are going to come up for a vote uh, uh, this week. Sure. I mean, and, and again, part of this is all sensitive, right, as you're kind of going through it and kind of holding everybody together. we got to get through the rules on Monday. Uh, and we're going through the steering process of getting folks on committees. But, but for example, when we say we want it, and, we, and, and Jake, we put out a list in, what, December 8th, trying to say, hey, here's what we think we need to tra transform this place. Here's what we need to see in any speaker. And so we've been out and open about that. But I want to make clear, this isn't about trying to, I, Chip Roy wants a spot on a committee. I haven't been promised anything, literally. I've, I've got nothing out of this deal for me personally. Does that mean I might end up on Rules Committee? Maybe, if that's what the, my colleagues want. We still have to go through that process. But what we have extracted are promises from the speaker to make sure that we have ideological diversity and representation among these uh, committees. 
Appropriations. There are two Freedom Caucus members out of 33 that are likely to be in the majority. So think about that. Mm -hmm. The HFC is 20% of the body, yet two of 33 appropriators. The Rules Committee. It's always a struggle to get anybody on there who's going to push back in the Rules Committee about, wait, why are we jamming a bill through that nobody's read? Right. So let's, let's get representation on these committees. And, um, and it's not about petty personal desires. I don't want to be on the Rules Committee. I don't right. want to leave my family on Sunday night and miss my kids to come up here. But I might do it if that's what my colleagues decide. So let me ask you uh, a question about whether or not the, whatever you want to call it, the chaos, the back and forth, yeah. the, the, uh, whether or not this is going to mark what the Congress is going to look like going forward over the next two years. McCarthy promised, one of the promises was not to raise the debt ceiling without some accompanying spending cuts. Correct. Congress had a similar showdown, uh, trying to force spending cuts in 2011. Yep. It led to America's credit rating getting downgraded because... The mark because they weren't able to arrive at a deal. It, uh, the markets felt the U.S. government had become, according to the ground, downgrading, quote, less stable, less effective, less predictable. <clears throat> and that had a real tangible detrimental effect on the American people and their pocketbooks, their retirement savings. What's the plan to make sure that doesn't happen again, that the chaos we saw this week or whatever you want to call it yeah. um, doesn't become uh, just what happens every time, especially when we're talking about major must-pass legislation like raising the debt ceiling, which is just about paying the bills for what has already been paid. Well, the fastest way to guarantee that we have debt rating problems is to keep spending money we don't have and keep piling up debt, and that's what we're doing. The Uniparty in Washington, Republicans and Democrats, the power brokers, which, by the way, were reflected by Mike Rogers when he goes in and he's pushing back on the... the he says, rebels. I will finish you. Right. He said. So why is that? Because when you push back on the swamp, the swamp's going to push right back. We saw that in display. That's okay. So you say, well, are we going to have this kind of uh, conflict going forward? I hope so. But we started this now. It's January. So the debt ceiling or the debate is going to be in a few months. Let's do it now, guys. Right. Let's get this out there. Both sides of the aisle... Everybody within each party, let's figure out how we're going to actually fix this because the American people are sick of us not doing our job. There is a bigger risk, though, for the U.S. defaulting on the debt ceiling when it comes to the debt ceiling vote than some short term embarrassment for Kevin McCarthy. That's a, the, the default is a bigger deal and could actually Un cost billions understood. of dollars. Understood. But remember in 2011 when that cut cap and balance was negotiated and put in place, and frankly, it worked for four or five years to constrain spending. Now, it had some side effects. Defense spending was getting whacked pretty good. Um, and we don't want to see that. We want to be able to figure out how we can get this going the right way to make sure defense is protected. But we need to put limits on spending and then get to the table. You have to do that at home, Jake. I have to do that at home. Every American has to do that. If we don't stop spending money we don't have, I promise you, we will never sit at a table. Colin Allred, who's going to be on here in a little bit that I was talking to in the green room, uh, Colin and I need to be able to sit at a table and figure out how we're going to fix this for the country. Yeah. We can't do that if the leaders jam through $1.7 trillion omnibus bills like happened in December, right. where we have no debate on the floor. We have to open this debate up, offer amendments, do our work, limit spending within our means, and then move for the country forward. If McCarthy fails to uh, offer a, 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 a debt ceiling bill that all has offsetting uh, spending cuts... If he offers what the Democrats in the Senate want, which is a clean bill, would you vote to vacate the speakership? Because it will now be able to be one person making that motion to look, vacate the speaker. Look, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to play the what if games on how we're going to use the tools of the House to make sure that we enforce uh, the terms of the agreement. But we will use the tools of the House to enforce the terms of the agreement. No will you negotiate with Democrats in the Senate? Because as you know, sure. this isn't just about you negotiating with Kevin McCarthy. Yep. Kevin McCarthy's much more conservative, sure. however much you think he is actually a conservative, compared to the people who run the Senate, which are the Democrats, or the White House, which is Joe Biden. Right. Well, remember that in 2011, Obama was in the White House, and we got cut cap and balance because we took it to the American people. The American people were tired of the status quo. We took the message to them, and we forced change. Our point is, let's fight now to end the status quo. Let's get in the rooms now. Republicans should send good appropriations bills over to the House. Make Chuck Schumer reject them. Let's send a good appropriations bill funding our men and women in uniform, who you so great, I'm grateful that you support them so much. Uh, let's go send them a good bill. Let's go send a good Homeland Security bill. Let's go send legislation. If Chuck Schumer doesn't want to pass those, then it's on him. Yeah. Let's come back to the table and let's talk about it. But let's do our part to balance the budget, do our job, 
and put everything on the table for everybody to sit down and do, do the work of the American people. In these talks, in these negotiations, did Kevin McCarthy or his emissaries ever say anything when it came to cuts or caps on Medicare and Social Security? So what we're talking about here, just so everybody knows, uh, is the setting spending at the FY22 levels, which would be, what, $1.471 trillion. And then let's all sit down and figure out how we're going to so do So all of it. So, let, well, let's sit down on how we're going to spend on that discretionary spending. What we've been very clear about is we're not going to touch the benefits that are going to people relying on the benefits under Social Security and Medicare. But we all have to be honest about sitting at the table and figuring out how we're going to make those uh, work, how we're going to deal with defense spending, and how we're going to deal with non-defense discretionary spending. But we've got to spend with uh, hold spending within our means.